There's a simple word for showing up, citizenship. I'm not talking about documentation status, papers and passports. I mean this deeper sense of, do you show up for your community? Welcome or welcome back to Aspen Ideas Show Up. I'm Zinclea Samoa, a correspondent at Now This and the host of Know This, a daily news show. And I'm Eric Liu. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Citizen University and the director of the Aspen Institute's program on citizenship and American identity. Show up. Show up. This is the second night we're coming together to talk about how democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. And so that means we got to show up and want to show up. We're deep in election season right now, but this conversation is not just about the importance of getting to the polls. The discussions, ideas, and performances you'll watch tonight are meant to provide a way to become more engaged with the way America operates. Show up. Because you're here tonight, we know you care about the future of our country, but caring isn't enough. What we're gonna do together is figure out how to convert care into action, concern into power. So many of the political tools we use today have been around since our democracy was founded. Local activism, protests, and thought-provoking and respectful debate are important facets of American democracy. And though technology has changed the speed of our interactions, the reasons for them are still very much the same. What does it mean to show up? For some people, it's voting. For others, it's protesting. For others still, it's just about understanding and communicating what you understand to the people around you. However you choose to show up, we're going to spend this next hour hearing stories, performances, and conversations that will sharpen our skills of citizenship. After that, we invite you to join an interactive session about civic engagement. These are fun and thought-provoking and led by people who will not only explain, but hope to inspire. Check out the interactive sessions here and get yourself signed up. And now it's time to show up. As an artist myself, I know there are many ways to creatively express your activism. Whether painting a bright sign to post in your window or crafting a poetic verse or creating large-scale works of artistic protest. Someone who has used their creativity to inspire is our next guest, Yellow Pain. Hello. I know the world won't give me nothing, so I gotta take it. And I know it's a way we can win. Keep us down. Could have a walk, but we don't know how. Don't let them tell you that your vote don't count. Well, he was in office for eight years, bro. Still ain't getting nothing done for it. Bro, you and me done worked at this barbershop them whole eight years, bro. They don't care about us, bro. No, that's fact, though. I really don't even remember the last time a president did something for us, to be honest. Yeah, I ain't trying to go out in that sun and vote. <laughs> bro. Not, you literally don't know what you're talking about, man. First thing first, you know back in middle school when they taught us it was three branches of the government, we forgot it when we got older. It's the judicial, the legislative, and executive. But all we know is the executive. That's the mayor or the governor and the president. Now none of them three people make no laws, they just be checking them. The laws come to their desk and all they do is say no or yes to it. So when the news station tried to tell us that Barack Obama couldn't put us on, we was all Saudi at Obama when it was the Congress members out along. We gotta focus on the legislative branch, yeah, they the ones that make the laws. Yeah, they the ones write how much food stamp money you get on the car. But when people that wanted to help us, wanted the job, I know they probably lost. Cause we ain't even know their name, we ain't know their face, we ain't know it all. So the Congress or the State House, that's legislative, they make laws. So what we want from the president is what they do, okay, y'all? See, they election every two years, but we don't never even go to those. The Congress, they can raise minimum wage, but we ain't even really know it, though. So you know how back in 08, when we all voted for Obama, we was all supposed to go back in 2010 and vote for the Congress. Cause they the ones make child support laws. They the ones choose if your kids at school get to eat steak or corn dogs. The state house make the court calls. So if the country failed, then you can't say it's them, it's your fault. Cause y'all ain't know to vote for Congress members that was for y'all. And they don't gotta leave after four years and we just let them sit. See, they don't wanna tell you this, they want you to focus on the president. Now the third branch is the judicial, that's judges. They the reason why John Crawford and Trey Vine had justice. So when Meek Mill got Locked up just for popping willies, we blame the judge and not the city when they let her get voted in, cause they ain't know who to vote against. Imagine life on the other side. Roads better, schools better, everybody get their license back, grocery store food better, custody of your kids back, homeless people get new shelters. If we gon' fix the US, we gotta start with them two letters. Me and you, somebody told us that the government wanna keep us broke. 
But the only reason why those people in the government is cause we ain't vote And I ain't talking about the president, I'm talking about the ones we ain't know See they was gonna try to keep it low, but it's gonna hurt them when they see the polls I know the world won't give me nothing, so I gotta take it And I know it's a way we can win, why won't nobody say it Rather keep us down. Could have a walk, but we don't know how. Don't let them say that your vote don't count. Hi, my name is Luria Freeman from Now This News, and today I'm joined by rapper and philanthropist Yellow Pain. What's up? Hey, how you doing? What's going on? I'm good. Glad to be here with you. Just gonna jump right in. You make the point in your video, My Vote Don't Count, that really our political pessimism is just us disenfranchising ourselves. When did you come to that realization in your own life? Yeah, um, so just with, with politics, like, you know, my cousin, she taught me everything about uh, voting. Um, and she asked me to make a song. And I, I, to be honest, I didn't have any prior knowledge about uh, voting. And um, she, she broke it down to me in so many details. And, and when she broke it down to me, it was a wake up moment. I was like, are you serious? Like, you, are you, do you mean to tell me that like, this is, you know, like we can change this through voting and we can change this through voting. And I was upset, like, why don't I know that? And why don't the people in my community know that? And it just let me know that um, it's a problem with the education system. You know, it's a problem with, it's a big gap between everyday people and politics. And, um, and, you know, in that moment, that's when I really woke up and I was like, oh, yeah, this got to be something we talk about. Yeah, a lot of people are just like you, like they vote for the president, but they don't realize that there's all these down ballot races, that these midterms that come every year is what really matter. And that's a point that you touch on really well in your video, I feel. Yeah, most definitely. I um, voted for Obama back in 2012. I felt like I was still, you know, I was still broke like my community was still messed up so it was like all right you know i'm cool on politics and then to know that there were so many other people that i could have voted for that could have actually directly impacted me like how do, how would i not know that and why don't i know that as an adult male in america somebody who's actively you know trying to you know uh promote change and promote positivity and, you know, supporting the community. How am I disengaged with my community and that disengaged from one of the key answers to changing it? And it just let me know, like, there's no information. Um, no, well, there's information out there, but there's nobody driving it, um, especially to the people who are disconnected from politics as a whole. So I wanted to be that voice. Yeah. I found that politicians in general tend to struggle with how they connect with the black community and making it feel genuine. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how the importance of language played into how you wrote My Vote Don't Count? Yeah, I think one thing that made me like, um, I guess the perfect person to write that record is just because Shortly before I was enlightened to voting, I was on a complete opposite spectrum. I was one of those people who felt like voting didn't matter. And, you know, when I hear the word, when I heard the word vote, it just instantly was like, ah, it just sound like some political mumbo jumbo, some self empowerment, some, you know, whatever. I, I was such a hater in the system, like just one of those people that you wouldn't even want to talk to if you actually cared about voting. And I think with me having that mindset and being woken up so strongly and so abruptly, um, it let me know all of the reasons why I felt the way I did. And one of the reasons is language. You know, you hear uh, judicial, legislative, executive, Congress, senators, uh, judges, you know, those words, you know, sometimes even just the lingo of what they can do. You might say something like gun reform or whatever, you know, what gun laws. And it just sounds like a lot. But sometimes it's as simple as a section of the song where I said, imagine life on the other side. Roads better, schools better, everybody get their life 
license back, grocery store food better, custody of your kids back, homeless people get new shelters. If we gonna fix the US, we gotta start with those two letters. And it's just like, sometimes you have to simplify it down to the person that you're referring to, that you're talking to. And like, what do you wanna see change in the world? How can voting affect that? And I think me being able to do that is just, you know, the first step in that hopefully a lot of politicians and people advocating for voting to follow suit and understand that some of the language that we that that are, is used in the political world can be simplified down to as simple something as simple as hey you can get more money on your check every two weeks yeah uh to that point no matter what happens on november 3rd what do you plan to do moving forward to continue to make this country the place that you want to see yeah most definitely so with with voting in general like i was uh like not too long ago on the last day to register to vote in Ohio, I went back to Ohio to my community and I, and I, you know, I talked to different people in the low income neighborhoods, some of the places I was from, places that I've been and, you know, moved around and I, and I was, you know, giving people registration forms, paper ballots, and just letting them know the importance of it. And I was pushing it. And, you know, people, a lot of times I, I was able to wake a lot of people up the same way that I was woke up just face to face. So in the voting space, I'll most definitely uh, I'll be back in two years, um, like even um, for the congressional, you know, the Congress election in two years um, for all the presidential elections, rather it's through music or just through, you know, just being a, a real person and going to my community and saying, hey, this is important. All right, Yellow, thank you so much for your time. This was amazing. And I guess I'll see you November 3rd. Most definitely. It was a pleasure. Aspen Ideas Show Up is generously underwritten by the Bezos Family Foundation. A hundred million. That is the number of people who did not vote in the 2016 election. It's also what motivated our next conversation participant to show up. Hi, I'm Jackie Huba, founder and executive director of Drag Out the Vote. Now, Drag Out the Vote is a national nonpartisan nonprofit that registers, educates, and turns out voters with the art and activism of drag. Now, you know, prior to founding this organization, I had never been an activist before. I just voted in presidential elections. But when I saw in 2016 that 100 million people didn't vote, I was floored. And that's when I started getting involved in voter engagement work. Uh, in 2017, I helped my friend Jeremy Carey, a lot of folks might know him as Phoebe O'Hara from RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, he was putting on a star-studded drag event for Hurricane Maria Relief for Puerto Rico, and that event raised over $80,000. And really, it was then that I was reminded about the power of drag artists to create change. You know, I was so inspired by Jeremy's event that I thought about this idea of mobilizing drag artists on a national scale to increase voter, voter engagement, and I asked Jeremy to spearhead it with me. And really, that's how Drag Out the Vote was born. So now I'd like to bring on national co-chair Britta Filter to talk with us more about why it's so important to vote and about making a plan to vote. Now, Britta was on RuPaul's Drag Race season 12, and she's actually the first queen of Polynesian descent to be on the show. She made headlines at the 2020 Women's March this year and is a fierce advocate in New York City. Welcome, Britta. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. You know we love you. You do so much for us. Thanks for everything you do. Of course, of course. Listen, I love Drag Out the Vote so much. You know, so with being on Drag Race, you have uh, such a huge national platform now. And can you share with everyone how you're using your drag platform for activism? Yeah, well, you know, drag queens have always been political. Um, it was drag queens and trans women of color that gave us the Stonewall Uprising in 1969. We also have the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence who organized and educated the queer community during the HIV AIDS crisis in the 80s. And, uh, you know, for me, it was, it was really during... Um, four years ago, um, I, I, I found out that one in five LGBTQ people were not registered to vote. I mean, and, and, and it, it blew my mind. It's like, those, those numbers are wild. That means I have so many friends that aren't registered to vote, and that's, that's crazy to me. So I, I wanted to change that. And so I, I thankfully, you approached me to host um, one of the first 
uh, benefits this year, uh, earlier this year, and it was in Minneapolis, and it was incredible. And I really felt the need to to help people to to get out the boat because it's it's so important. Um, so as a national co-chair, um, I think it's so important to speak to all voters across the country, uh, no matter who they vote for, and just let them know, listen, if you want change in the world, mama, you can't complain unless you vote. <laughs> So this year, um, we are voting for LGBTQIA plus equality, uh, trans rights, uh, we have queer work workplace protections, uh, better access to life-saving HIV prevention, and treatment and gender-affirming healthcare, and so much more for uh, our incredible community. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's so much that voters can do to protect the LGBT community with their vote, and so it's really, really important. But, you know, we're seeing an upswell of interest in, in casting about this year, but voters are also facing um, great difficulties and attempts at voter suppression. Can you uh, share with the audience, you know, uh, how can they make sure their voice is heard this year? Well, I think what you need to do is you need to make a plan. Everyone needs to make a plan. You need to be organized when you come to this, especially during this pandemic. Um, I, I think what people need to do is uh, if you're able to vote early, vote early. Please vote early. Like go, go and find out. If you want to vote by mail, I suggest that you check out uh, dragoutthevote2020.org uh, slash SOS for more information. And it's just very specific on procedures and what to do. And uh, you know, if you're going to go to the polls, I, I suggest you make sure that you bring a mask, bring hand sanitizer, um, stay your social distance apart. I, I would even suggest bringing your own pen. Um, truly, because if you, I just want everyone to be safe, but it's so important. I mean, I think also with uh, voting early, you don't have to, you can schedule it in your schedule. Uh, like, it's, it's much easier if you, if you just vote early. So I really suggest that if people are going to go to the polls. Sure. I love that. Thanks for, for sharing all that. There's so many ways to vote in person, uh, through the mail, and um, hopefully everyone will make that plan. Hey, Britta, thanks so much. And uh, just to remind everyone, if you want more information on how to drag out the vote with us, again, the URL is dragoutthevote2020.org. Thanks. Thank you. And now some more content to keep getting you fired up to show up. I'm Ernest Mateo Cisneros, and I have one simple question for you. What do you do to lift yourself up when you're feeling down? Millions of Americans struggle with their mental health every day. And knowing my local community of Colton, California lacked easily accessible and useful resources for those struggling, I co-founded OneSimpleQuestion.org, which helps fight stigmas surrounding mental health and provide quick and useful resources for those struggling. Like a weekly video that features everyday people saying out loud they feel down sometimes too, and sharing what they do to lift themselves up. I started it to show you that everybody feels down sometimes, even your boss or your principal or your teacher. Since we've launched this year, One Simple Question has uplifted over a thousand people. One Simple Question is a community-driven, accessible resource for my neighbors who need uplifting, and most importantly, to show them that you are not alone. Voting is a hopeful act, though sometimes it doesn't seem to be effective. But there is hope for democracy and more equitable representation. Our next guest points the way forward and the path he charts begins right where you live. Hi, I'm Varsha Sharma, the senior correspondent at Now This, and I'm thrilled to be talking today to David Cole, who is the legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union, an organization that is perhaps busier than ever right now, so thank you for taking the time. David is the author of Engines of Liberty, The Power of Citizen Activists to Make Constitutional Law, which is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So we're very close to the end of this election now. Millions of Americans have already voted, whether by mail, absentee ballots, or early voting. What is the priority for the ACLU right now, and what should um, citizens and voters be thinking about in terms of the next couple of weeks? Vote, vote, vote. Uh, you know, we, we at the ACLU, we're a nonpartisan organization, but we're an organization that believes in democracy, uh, and that requires that people uh, vote. It's the, it's the most powerful tool we have uh, as citizens to affect the policies of our government and, the, and, and our future, uh, and, but, but it only uh, is a tool uh, that works for us if we actually um, deploy it, uh, and so it is absolutely critical that people uh, get out there and vote. And so we at the ACLU are uh, encouraging people to vote, uh, uh, educating people on how they can, you know, get registered and how they can vote, what are the various options for them. Uh, we're urging people 
to get out there uh, to the polls. Uh, we're urging people to urge their friends and their family uh, to get out to the polls. And we're urging people, most importantly, to vote like your rights depend on it, because they do. Speaking of rights, then, um, I think we're seeing record turnout in a lot of places already. We're also seeing some obstacles to making sure that every vote is being counted. So what should people keep in mind regarding that? Well, it, 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 you know, the, the premise of a democracy is that the people get to decide, the people get to vote. And so government should be making it easy for people to vote, not hard for people to vote. We have, uh, at the ACLU, have fought both in the courts and in the legislatures uh, and before election commissions to get rid of obstacles to voting that are unnecessary, voter ID laws, witness requirements for mail-in ballots during the pandemic that would require you to go to somebody else and expose yourself to somebody else in order to, to get them to sign a, a form. Those sorts of things should not be, uh, should not be part of the, the, the system uh, in, a, in, a, in a pandemic. And so we are suing to, to get rid of a lot of those obstacles. But it's, what's most important is that people understand what the rules are in their state, because they vary from state to state, and that they use their right to vote. You mentioned lawsuits. I understand that the Republicans expanded their legal defense fund to some $20 million earlier this summer um, when we're talking about litigation in the courts. And I know the Democrats have some money set aside for this as well. Why is that even necessary and what can citizens do about it? Well, you know, I mean, th th there's this is something that obviously will be very consequential for many people, right? Who, who gets elected? Uh, and a lot of people have a lot at stake. And so both sides have have geared up to fight it out in the courts if need be. Um, and we um, we also will fight it out in the courts if need be. We're not fighting on behalf of the Republicans or on behalf of the Democrats. We're fighting on behalf of the American people um, that, to make sure that they have the right to vote and that they have the right to have their votes counted. That is one thing I think we're trying to prepare our audience for is we very well may not know who the actual winner is on November 3rd, right? It's going to take some time to count all of these ballots. That's right. And, you know, that's partly because never before have we had so many absentee ballots, so many mail-in ballots. There are some states, five states, uh, that have gone to vi virtually 100% mail-in ballots long before this. And so they're, they know how to do it. They're all set up to do it. But many of the states relied principally on voters going to the polls and some absentee ballots. In the pandemic, many of those states are going to have a massively increased number of uh, absentee ballots, and they may not have the infrastructure to count them as quickly as they need to do. Uh, there are some states where you can't start counting the mail-in ballots until Election Day, which means that they're very unlikely to be done counting by uh, the, the, the close of the polls that day. So, yeah, um, it is often the case that uh, you, you don't know the results for sometimes several days, sometimes more than a week after the election uh, takes place. But if that's what's necessary to count all the ballots, it's more important that we count all the ballots than that we know what the uh, outcome is on, on November 3rd. Now, one uh, major issue I think that is motivating a lot of voters right now is the unexpected Supreme Court vacancy that we now have with the um, tragic passing of the late Justice Ginsburg. Justices Alito and Thomas also recently wrote in opposition of the 2015 marriage equality case, which of course understandably caused alarm um, a, a, among a lot of LGBTQ Americans. What is your take on what's at stake, what's being threatened, what are you most worried about? So, you know, to, to, to get a sense of what's at stake with respect to uh, the next appointment to the Supreme Court, it, you only have to look at how many important cases have been decided in the last 15, 20 years by five to four votes with Justice Ginsburg in the five justice majority. And they include uh, decisions to protect abortion rights, to um, uh, protect uh, LGBT equality, to extend marriage uh, to all folks on equal terms, to uh, uphold affirmative action, to uphold the Affordable Care Act, five to four. So that's all of that is at stake in, uh, in this nomination, which will take a seat vacated by a civil rights hero, someone who you know, literally got the court to recognize that sex discrimination violates the Constitution when she was an ACLU lawyer, um, uh, and put in her place a very hard right conservative. That's going to change the, the, the balance of power on the court in a significant way. 
Now, I think a, a main takeaway of your book is that all politics is local and that while we should be paying attention to these major national issues and decisions, people should also really be engaged at a local level as well. So can you talk about why that's important? So absolutely. So, you know, w when we think about constitutional rights, say take marriage equality, right? Marriage equality, how did marriage equality come about? Uh, the Supreme Court in 2015 recognized that the Constitution gives same-sex couples the, right, the same right as opposite-sex couples to get married. Um, but it wasn't the Supreme Court that gave us that. It wasn't even the lawyers before the court who made the arguments that led the court to uh, reach that result. It was the work of citizens around this country coming together in all sorts of organizations that were seeking to advance LGBT uh, equality and dignity, working at the local level to advance the conception of equality and dignity for LGBT people. And they did it in boardrooms, getting companies to extend domestic partnership benefits. They did it in state family court, getting family law uh, 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 revised so that same-sex couples could adopt uh, uh, children. Uh, they did it by getting city councils to adopt re um, regulations to prohibit uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And then they did it in state courts, seeking first in Vermont, then in Massachusetts, then in Connecticut, a right to same-sex uh, marriage. And only after they had sort of developed the momentum of all those wins in all those different forums, um, th was it possible uh, to win that case uh, in, in the Supreme Court? And so liberty is really the charge of all of us. We can all be guardians of liberty, and the way we are guardians of liberty is by organizing and associating with like-minded citizens around the issues that we care about and standing up uh, and, 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 and speaking out and working together for those rights. And if you do that, you can do you can make you can change the world. The times are overwhelming right now. It's been a really tough year. It's been a really tough couple of years for people. What gives you hope right now? So what gives me hope is the response we have seen ever since President Trump was elected. And the response is, I think, a, a response that shows that American citizens understand the power of civil society, the importance of standing up and standing together. And I see that in the Women's March, the single largest march in, in American history, in the crowds that went out to airports to protest the Muslim ban. Tens of thousands of Americans went out to, to protest that. To the, the crowds that protested his efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act and take away uh, health insurance for poor people, which uh, succeeded in barring him from uh, being able to do that. To the um, March for Our Lives movement, um, um, sp sparked by the Parkland shooting, but has become a national youth-led movement for gun control, to the Me Too movement. I mean, sexual harassment has been around for a long time, but it was in the Trump era that people came together and said, we're going to do something about it. And they really uh, have. To the, 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 the Black Lives Matter protests on the streets today uh, in response to George Floyd and, and systemic inequality in this country. You know, I think if any one of those movements had, had occurred in the last four years, we would say, wow, that's remarkable. But that all of those movements have risen up, I think, is a reflection of the health of our, of our citizenry, the, 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 the resolve of people to get engaged and to fight for the values that they believe in. And at the end of the day, that's what builds hope. Hope is built by action. So you take action and you create hope. And people are doing that. And so I'm very hopeful. I think that's a great message, and it has been remarkable to see the protests this summer um, going into this fall, and especially how the next generation, a new generation of people are stepping up and leading those protests. So, David, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. The interactive sessions start at 8 p.m. Eastern time and are not to be missed. There are multiple topics to choose from, and you can still register at aspenideas.info slash register. Space is still available to join a webinar titled Tools of Citizenship from the Constitution, hosted by Jeff Rosen, CEO of the National Constitution Center. 
Together, you'll explore the freedoms that framers crafted to effectively engage in shaping our democracy. Up next, another example of someone who knows how to show up. Hi, my name is Claudia Svager. I'm the co-founder of Flare Now, which is a common application for scholarships and professional development opportunities. I believe one zip code should not determine economic opportunity. My family and I immigrated here to the United States with nothing but the clothes in our backs seeing cheap. One goal, the American dream. But this was often too distant as being a first generation American and a first generation college student had limited guidance and a limited support network. This is something our kids face every single day as the average student to counselor ratio in American high schools is 491 students for every one counselor. This is what inspired me to co-found Flair Now and help impact over 400 low-income students navigate the college and career process. What I learned from this opportunity is that we must stop operating in silos and start operating in love because this is how our world will grow more compassionately. Every single one of us has something to contribute, but it's up to you to do with love. Join me in crafting the future today. Up next, an additional piece to motivate you to show up. My name is Kara Antone. I'm Corda Lane and Thon Altham, former president of the Native American Women's Association at Washington State University, where Native student organizations like mine work tirelessly to elevate Native issues. In 2018, we worked assiduously to get Indigenous People's Day recognized by the city of Pullman. With the support of our advisor, we developed a letter, gained supporting signatures from other student organizations, held community gatherings at the heart of campus, and attended multiple council meetings until the resolution was finally passed. Indigenous People's Day is a now formal holiday celebrated by both the City of Pullman and Washington State University, benefiting generations to come. By accomplishing this, we have not only gained visibility for ourselves as Native students, but we've created a space to collectively empower and uplift Indigenous voices and shine light on issues that affect our communities. Elevating the stories of Indigenous peoples became our biggest accomplishment because as Native youth, our stories and experiences are the driving force for our leadership and thus our future. You too can use your voice to action change within your community. It's easier to forge a path of showing up when you see people who've done it before us in a monumental way. Here's a tribute to a trailblazer who shows us all the way. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice. I am proud to nominate for Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Born at a time when girls were trained to sit down and stay quiet, she spent her early life being demoted, denigrated, and denied, largely because she wasn't a man. No need to go to college, they said, but she showed up. Don't waste time in law school, they told her, but she showed up and graduated at the top of her class. Still, federal courts wouldn't let her clerk and law firms wouldn't hire her, but she kept learning, eventually earned clerkship, and dug deep into the heart of the law, creating cases so powerfully argued that when she showed up, the courts had to listen. She defined discrimination and showed how it hurt us all. Still, as a justice on the federal bench and then the Supreme Court, they demanded decorum, delicacy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg gave them that, but also something more powerful, dissent. She showed up and spoke up for the rights of women, for the rights of the underprivileged, for privacy rights and voting rights, for marriage rights. And though she lost some of her biggest battles, she kept fighting, arguing, speaking truth, and she kept showing up until the day she died. She made her country a better, more equal place, one where more people are free and are free to make their voices heard, a place in pursuit of the right for everyone to show up. Showing up comes in various shapes and sizes, and electoral politics are just one way to be civically engaged. We've asked people who know how to show up to share their stories. Here's another in a series that we'll share. I'm Salvador Gomez Colon, a teenage changemaker from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Three years ago in 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated my home island. The surrounding destruction disconcerted me and I did not feel at ease resting on the privilege of having a roof over my head 
or found my toes I could turn. Even as the bleak reality made me feel hopeless, I wanted to find a way to harness my empathy and give hope to those in despair. However, as I thought about what I could do, I came to a standstill, because after all, I was just still a 15-year-old high school freshman. But I took the time to observe and recognize people's needs, and two things stuck out, the absence of power and the lack of clean clothing. I ventured to launch Light and Hope for Puerto Rico, an initiative to raise $100,000 to purchase solar lamps and hand-powered washing machines and distribute them to the most severely impacted communities. In the end, I raised nearly double my fundraising goal and reached thousands of families across Puerto Rico. As I continue my humanitarian efforts and advocacy, I always keep in mind the lesson the light and hope taught me, that even in our darkest of times, we can always find and give a spark of light. Time's Up is a movement that is changing the world, a movement that insists that everyone should be safe and respected at work, a movement that is creating a world where women can have an equal shot at success in a world where no one is okay with sexual harassment and assault. Joining us now is one of the leaders of this movement. Well, Tina Chen, thank you so much for making the time to speak with us. Oh, it's wonderful to be with you again, Zinclay. Yeah, so glad we can talk. And so for those who don't know, you are the president and CEO of Time's Up Now and the Time's Up Foundation. You also co-founded the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. You're a former assistant to President Barack Obama, executive director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. I think when people hear your many accomplishments and accolades, they may assume that you just started here. You started on top quote unquote. Uh, but can you maybe walk us through your journey? I know you began the streets of Chicago as an organizer. Talk to us about that and how you've remained centered uh, on the work of gender equity and women. Uh, well, it, you, no, I definitely did not start here. It's been a long journey. Um, I'm about to turn 65. So that tells you how long, how long the journey has been. You know, I, you know, I got to first acknowledge my parents. You know, I am the daughter of Chinese immigrants. My parents came here right after the war, you know, in 1949. I was born in Columbus, Ohio, grew up in the Midwest as sort of like the only Chinese kid on the, you know, my, my East suburban Cleveland, Ohio existence, which I think sort of prepared me, right, for this kind of being the only being the only woman the only person of color in so many settings um right after college actually i found myself in illinois in springfield working for state government but right at the moment of the equal rights amendment and all of the activity there and that's i think what being in the right place at the right time turned me into a feminist and taught me about organizing, taught me about, you know, how to organize 100,000 person marches down the streets of Chicago, which is what we did back then. Um, and, but then I actually went to law school. So the thing that people don't actually remember about my background is Zinclair, I spent two decades as a corporate lawyer, wanting, working for wow. one of the biggest law firms in the world at the time, Skadden Arps, um, doing that by day and actually loving learning that. It was tough, it was hard, but solving problems was something I loved doing. But uh, my extracurriculars, my like night job, was to stay in touch with women's issues and pro-choice yeah. issues and you know progressive candidates. And then in between there, I was always, I was, you know, I was also being a single mom at the time. So juggling all those things is something I'm familiar with, but passionate about because doing what I called my extracurricular work is what kept me in touch with my passion while I was also making a living as a single mom for my kids and making a career for myself in the law. I'm so glad that you mentioned that beyond your professional experiences, you were a single mom. And I know that a lot of the work of Time's Up focuses on equity within the workplace. And I've heard from a lot of activists amid the pandemic concern about the impact it's going to have specifically on women, given how often they bear the brunt when it comes to childcare and education now that so much learning is happening virtually. What have you heard about this? What is Time's Up doing in regards to how the pandemic is impacting gender equity? Oh, no, it's critical, Zinclay. I mean, remember, at Time's Up, you know, we were formed out of the moment of combating sexual harassment, right, in the post-Harvey Weinstein moment. But we also know, in addition to supporting survivors, we don't just want to pick the pieces up after sexual harassment happens. The goal is to create workplaces where it never happens. And that means we've got to create safe, equitable, and fair work for everyone. Um, and so, you know, that means addressing all of these issues like caregiving, like all the structural barriers that keep women from work. And what we're seeing right now is the struggles that working women have had for generations are laid bare for everyone to see in this pandemic and are having potentially devastating effects on undoing 
really literally decades of progress that women have made in participating in the labor force. You know, in the September jobs report, Sinclair, it shows that 886,000 women over the age of 20 have dropped out of the workforce, according to the September wow. job report, as against 200,000 men, right? Because women, and m nearly half of them, are black and Latinx women, right? So women, and especially women of color, are bearing the brunt of this pandemic and are bearing the brunt of having no schools open, childcare centers closed, no paid leave, no paid sick leave, and inability to figure out how are they going to care for their children and stay in the workforce. And those are the structural barriers that we have got to address going forward. Absolutely. And I think it's powerful that you mentioned how Time's Up began, right, in response uh, to just like a collective movement that we saw. So what do you say now? I, I mean, we've seen so many protests this year. Uh, what do you say to people? How do you turn this momentum, this protest momentum, into practical organization? What have been your biggest learnings? Uh, what do organizers and advocates need to know about really creating some institutional change? Well, first we've got to tell those stories, right? See the impact of what public policy change, what change within companies means, and how that will translate to the issues that people care about and are in the streets protesting about, you know? So how a change in local government really is the thing that will affect what the investments are in our social safety net as against, you know, police policing, for example. You know, what the public policy changes are that we need to have paid leave, to have childcare, to have caregivers actually receive a living wage. And then actually right now, because we are on the verge of the most important election of our lives, translating that, what people need to see in their lives right now to this particular moment, because this is a unique moment where people are angry or frustrated or worried about their, 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 their next paycheck. This is a moment where every single citizen in this country has the power to do something about it, and that is to go vote. And we've heard a lot of people like yourself calling for people to vote, but I, I'd love to know beyond voting, what did the conversations practically look like for forming Time's Up? Was it over coffee? Were you on the streets together at the Women's March and you said, you know what, we need to do this? Like, what did it practically, tangibly look like? So it's interesting you're asking, Clay, because the story of the creation of Time's Up is really both unique, but I give so much credit to the women who were in their room, and it wasn't me. Um, what happened was in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein reporting in the New York Times, the New Yorker, almost exactly three years ago, right, this month in October, um, is when they first appeared. And that was the moment in which all of these women in Hollywood who had thought they were alone realized they weren't alone, right? And came together first just to support each other, but to their credit, very quickly went to turn their pain into action. And more than that, Sinclair, they wanted to actually reach out beyond their own industry. They realized that they were women who had some power and privilege, and they wanted to use it to actually address the experiences of farm worker women, of hotel clerks, right? Of, you know, people who are just, you know, working on the shop floors of our manufacturing industries, women who didn't have that power. And that's what led both to the creation of Time's Up and our first project, the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. To the point also, you mentioned the 2020 election. We know that Kamala Harris is on the ticket and you're no stranger to working closely with a woman of color in the public eye. I'm thinking of uh, First Lady Michelle Obama. What work is Time's Up doing and what do you say about the double standard that so often women face in politics, but especially women of color? How are you combating that actively in this moment? Well, we have been very active on this. Actually, we started a project called We Have Her Back. And you know, you can actually text the words her back to 30644 to join this and learn more about it. We actually started it before we knew who the woman VP nominee was going to be because we had actually seen this before. We knew it was going to be a woman. We knew she was going to be subjected to all forms of sort of sexist and misogynistic attacks. And so, you know, several of us launched it with a memo to newsrooms, right? Like to now this, you know, saying we're going to watch for this. We're going to watch for that kind of coverage. And I will tell you, Zinclay, the other reason I'm so passionate about this is, you know, the kind of discourse that we're having in the political sphere is so pervasive that it infects every other part of our culture, right? It, it, it shapes how we think about women leaders, not just as political leaders, but as business leaders or as leaders in our community. I think it contributes to the reason why there is not a single black woman CEO in the Fortune 500 today. 
It's 2020. There's not a single one. And that's because this kind of language, this kind of treatment of women of color in power so infects every part of how we're thinking about it. It's what our children are listening to. So it shapes, you know, how little girls think about their possibilities, how little boys will treat them as they grow up. So we've got to call it out. We've got to change our culture. That's really powerful. And I think to end, I do want to ask you, knowing all of that, right, you said discourse, the discourse in our country right now is difficult and turbulent. So knowing all that, the theme um, of today's conference and the, the few days that we're in is show up. So looking ahead, how can we collectively show up in a way that affirms uh, that women and girls deserve equity uh, and deserve a seat at the table, deserve representation and deserve to lead? Well, I think, you know, we show up by, number one, like in We Have Her Back, speaking out when something wrong is getting said, right? Don't just neutrally report the president, you know, said this, right? Say it was wrong. It was racist. You know, that was what, you know, is going on there. Call it out for what it is. And number two, everyone, women and men need to show up for women in leadership, you know, support them, speak out. The most powerful thing is when a white man actually speaks out in support and backs up a woman of color, you know, striving to be a CEO, striving to be the manager of the restaurant in which she works in, right? Show up in your everyday lives by standing up for the women around you, for the women who are sort of the little girls who are speaking out, show up for them, support them, lift them up. You know, whether you do it on your social media or you just do it in sending a kind note to someone as who's struggling along the way. Um, I think that's what we need to do. And times are tough. It's all tough for everybody right now. So the idea of showing up in big ways and in small ways right now could not be more important as we see our way through this sort of election and through getting through this pandemic and these crises we're in. Absolutely. Well, Tina, thank you so much for sharing all of your insights and your learnings and for making the time. It was so great to chat with you again. Oh, it was great to see you, Zen Play, and I hope you are safe and doing well. Yeah, same to you. Stay well, everyone, and thanks so much for watching. Aspen Ideas Show Up is generously underwritten by the Bezos Family Foundation. You feeling fired up? You feeling motivated? It is a lot to take in, but we can take it in together. Here's another piece about how we can show up. Benji Backer here, founder and president of the American Conservation Coalition. ACC is a nonprofit organization that focuses on market-based effective environmentalism. In 2017, I founded ACC because I thought the environment should be a nonpartisan issue and wanted to engage my conservative peers on climate and conservation solutions that they could get behind. In April, we released the American Climate Contract, the first ever market-based climate change platform because we believe that pragmatic action is far more valuable than rhetoric. In fact, I'm recording this video from Tennessee as I travel across the country for the electric election road trip. Throughout this initiative, we're highlighting incredible leaders who haven't waited for the government to take action on climate change, like the chief environmental officer at Microsoft, the chairman of the Jamestown Sklalem tribe, and clean energy pioneers in the heart of the Midwest. We need solutions at all levels, and it starts with innovation-based local solutions that can be scaled at a global level. We can't afford to wait for the perfect solution, and I'm proud to lead ACC and promote effective solutions that are implementable today. And now a Bezos Scholar in conversation with Aspen Institute President and CEO, Dan Porterfield. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Porterfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. I'm joined now by Pablo Hockey, who is Executive Analyst for the City of San Jose, California. Uh, 24 years old, he's helping to drive the city's census canvassing campaign, which has pushed San Jose to reach the highest census 2020 response rate among any city in the United States with 300,000 or more people. That's a big deal. Uh, Pablo, uh, great to be with you today. Thanks so much for having me, Dan. So why is the census so important? Sure, so the census is really an essential part of, of our country and our democracy. There's a reason the Founding Fathers uh, put it in Article 1 of the Constitution. Uh, not only does it determine political representation, like how many Congress members a state gets, but it also shapes how uh, billions of dollars of federal funding are, are used towards uh, housing and education and transportation and much more and where those go to, um, to various communities and parts of the country. So when I was your age, I was a census taker, 
Um, uh, and I went around to houses and apartments in Baltimore City where people had not returned the census. And I got them to talk with me and answer the questions. And I think I got a dollar for a short form and three dollars for a long form, something like that. Um, uh, a lot of great life lessons. What are you doing in particular to drive up the census return rate for San Jose? Well, we have a really strong um, team of canvassers who are mostly from the city, uh, they're, they're from the community, they look like the community, and we're focusing on parts of the city that um, are seeing lower response rates and making sure to um, show, show people that uh, we're from the city government and we care and we want to also connect them with resources as this is a time of great need with the pandemic and the recession. And I think this is important because to, to, to really emphasize um, community and, and like locally based um, campaigns because uh, San Jose is a city that is a majority of people of color and the census uh, systematically undercounts people of color, especially, especially um, black American Indian and Hispanic Americans. And so those really important uh, applications of the census that I mentioned before um, are actually come into play here because the, the inequality, racial and wealth inequality we see in this country can be perpetuated and even widened when we don't count people in the same way. Now, some young people who have that motivation choose to do it through the arts. Some choose to do it perhaps through the private sector. Um, you're interested in doing that through public service. And what is it about public service that really excites you? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we need all kinds of people with all kinds of talents to be involved in uh, in movements for, for, for progress and for change. And I think part of understanding how we can contribute is, is knowing what, and what kind of work makes us feel fulfilled and connected. For me, it's meeting people, it's understanding people's passions, their needs, um, and working together to create institutions or um, you know, uh, changes and, and law that feel meaningful and lasting. And so I've been involved since I was, since early in high school uh, with presidential campaigns and caucuses, with creating a vegetable garden for my high school, with lobbying at the state capitol. Um, and it was always really exciting to see the, the power that young people can have. Um, and I also feel like we need to express that power if, if we want to, to, to get to a better place. I, I love hearing that you have such a civic imagination that you act on. And I remember hearing this incredible story that when you were in high school, you attended the Aspen Ideas Festi Summer Festival in 2015. And then you went as a Bezos scholar. And then you went back home to Iowa and put on your own festival. And say a little bit about that experience. It, it was a great opportunity. I was, I was really grateful to be part of the Bezos Scholars Program, which I'd recommend any high schoolers uh, who attend uh, public high schools to check that out. Um, and I, I went to Aspen in 20, 2014, and I remember going to the session called uh, Future Metropolis, hosted by uh, a design group called Terraform One, and it really inspired the uh, what I chose to major in in college. Uh, at Stanford, Urban Studies was my, my major, as well as the work I'm doing today. And uh, yeah, afterwards, they provided, uh, after providing leadership training and the funding, I was able to put on a local ideas festival in my hometown of Davenport, Iowa. Uh, it was focused on getting young people involved in the conversation about the future of the downtown area and reimagining uh, the space as a place reinfused with the kind of life, energy, arts, culture, um, and you know, public transit, bike lanes, all the things that it has seen in the past that we want to bring back to it. Um, and that was a really, uh, really cool experience. How beautiful. Pablo Hockey, he's one of that passionate, serving kind, the future of this country and this world. Thank you, Pablo. Thanks so much, Dean. And now a performance by one of my favorite bands, Infinity Song, the sibling band and music collective who has toured throughout the United States. Yes, we could talk a little bit about ourselves and our story. Um, we're siblings, all five of us are siblings, mm -hmm. and we're five out of nine. There are nine of us in total, um, all from the same mom and dad. Um, our dad raised us singing and performing since since all of us were very, very young, he directed and founded a few choirs in Detroit where we're from. And then he just took it from there and started uh, raising us all to sing together. And um, we've 
Uh, we got signed to Rock Nation about four years ago. Uh, after that, Victory released a solo project um, about two years ago. And now we're finally releasing a project together as a, as a group. And we're so excited to be here, to be you know, in the room with you guys. Well, <laughs> not in the room, but in the virtual, virtual room. room. <laughs> this song that we're gonna sing is called Matt Love. Um, the message is all about family and that real family love. So hope you enjoy. I've got my love for you, brother You've been with me from the start I've got my love for you, sister You got a piece of my heart Even though I know I don't say it enough I want you to know what I feel in my heart I don't want you to think that I take you for granted You mean so much to me, please understand it Cause I got mad love for you Yeah, I got mad love for you Yeah, I got mad love for you Yeah, I got mad love for you Oh, I got mad love for you. Yeah, I got mad love for you. Oh, I got mad love for you. I've got mad love for you, mama. You brought me into this world. I've got mad love for you, father. You taught me to persevere. Even though I know I don't say it enough I want you to know what I feel in my heart I don't want you to think that I take it for granted You owe me so much to me, please understand it Cause I got mad love for you I got my love for you. 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 last two nights, we've been talking about showing up with a spirit of spirit, joy and hope and possibility. And those things matter because democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. At the same time, let's get real. There are a lot of folks right now who are scared, who are hopeless, who are anxious, not only about the future, but about this very moment right now. And what it means for us to show up is to show up emotionally for each other. Make that space for people to say what pains them, what anguishes them, what worries them right now. Make that space for yourself. 
how we show up for each other cannot just be rah-rah, and it cannot just be rational and about what the head thinks. This is heart work. This is gut work. This is soul work. And we do that together by showing up as full human beings. And that is almost a wrap. The whole point of showing up is that you have to keep showing up. It might be easy to click out of this window and leave here thinking that you've accomplished something. Maybe you got a little smarter, maybe you got a few new ideas. But the big question is, are you going to put them into action? Our ideas, interviews, and entertainment are over for this event, but we're going to leave you with a parting gift. Starting right now, you can jump into one of these interactive sessions, virtual discussion groups that will answer questions and give you the information and energy you need to make showing up a thing you do every single day for your community, your country, and our future. I'm Zinclea Samoa, and on behalf of Aspen Ideas and Now This News, I want to thank you for showing up. Aspen Ideas Show Up is generously underwritten by the Bezos Family Foundation. You'll see on screen a code that will take you to a survey. Give us five more minutes of your time and give us your feedback. <laughs>